Let's talk a little bit about the materials that, you know, Bankston and Moses and, you know, on all the interviews we talk, you know, you talk about some of the ways and things Larry was using. So let's just, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what materials the artists, that Venice, some of the Venice artists were using. Well, Billy was doing, was painting and he was doing Draculas and then he got into Stars and Stripes and he did, they were oil paintings, Stars and Stripes. And then he started making metal panels, the dentos. And I bought a couple of them. Um, not holding up too well. He won't do anything about it. <laughs> Don't put that in. <laughs> um, I think that Billy would every two weeks change his apartment and studio. So every time he came, in, the living room was in a different place. It was wild. I, I thought, I still think he's great, greatest decorator I ever met. And I learned so much from that. That was, and a lot of the artists did that. And Larry did that. Um, not as much as Billy did. Billy was the primo. Um, Tony was banging nails into a piece of can, which he still does. <laughs> Most consistent artist. <laughs> um, Moses was painting, but he was trying to do architecture. He took on some buildings to do. He was fascinated with that. And I think he was the one that first gave me license to use corrugated. I mean, I loved it, but he said, use it. Um, Had he used it in something? No, he was chicken. He, he did Jackie Graber's studio on Venice. I, it may still be there. It's a black box. I, don't, I haven't seen it lately. It was two studios. She, I was going to do it for her. Her, I was doing a house in the canyon for her, and he was doing the two studio. And he, I, I was egging him on to use the corrugated. And uh, he ended up copying my Danziger building. Not copying, but building, using those kind of details. So he, he lost courage, <laughs> even though he was pushing me to do stuff. Um, that was a big disappointment for me that, you know, I thought he was my macho friend. <laughs> he went that way. But he, he was interested in architecture. He would hang out and look at what's going on. Um, Larry was the kindest human being on the planet. Um, he was all, I'm going to start crying. He was always open, friendly. He took me in as a friend almost from the beginning. He was a lot of fun. He was, he was the hottest artist in the group at the time. And he didn't have an attitude about it. And he was, he was a buddy. And I was doing a magnet store, which I think you have pictures of. And I wanted to have this glass used glass as an atrium and I talked to him about it and he, he told me how to detail it so it wouldn't crack and he came down and helped me. He looked at it and I think there's a picture of him there. Um, he, it was just about the time when he was starting to get into the coating, what do you call it, micro coating, whatever. Vacuum so, coating. Vacuum coating. And he had the machine going, and 
I used to go to his studio with my daughter, the one who passed away three years ago. In fact, she, a few weeks before she died, she sang the song that Larry, she reminded me. About the shadow, you know. Do you know the song, The Shadow? Is it all pain? Huh? No, no, he talked about, he was making those, the pieces, the big glass pieces that were vacuum for him. He had one that looked like a mountain range. Oh, yeah. And they were zigzag. And they had shadows and and reflections, and he made up a song. He'd sit there and sing about it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. he, he knows it, because I the sang it. The Iceberg in the Shadow? Yeah, it's The Iceberg in the Shadow, but he had a song that went with it. And Leslie remembered it all those years. And when she was in the hospital, she sang it to me. And Larry remembers the song. He'll sing it to us. Maybe we can get him to sing it that night. <laughs> um, and was it Larry or Ed who was first using some of the open studs and exposing some of the uh, walls? I think a lot of people, I think Billy was doing it, I think everybody was doing it. It was in the air. You know, there was stud buildings going up all around us. And uh, it had a wonderful aesthetic to it, so it became clear. And, but what Rico's talking about is Larry had the studio on... on market? Market, yes, where the, market, where the restaurant is. And he had a, uh, <laughs> he had a toilet downstairs, a guest toilet. And he left the studs and with the plumbing and he put a piece of glass on it. And somebody else did something with that. Oh, Ed did. Uh, Laura Lee Stearns. Yeah, you know it all already. <laughs> did Laura Lee Stearns dining room. He took a little cutout about this big and he left the studs and put glass on either side. So it was a window to the next door. And then, so then, as luck would have it, I was asked to do the Russian constructive show at, at LACMA. And Russian construct with, with Stephanie and with, uh, what's his name? Maurice took me. And, you know, I was like a duck to water with, the, with the, that stuff. I mean, the Talon and all of them. And I spent, whenever I did a show, it kind of, one of the reasons I did it was they didn't pay me very much, but one of the reasons I did it is they let me spend time with the, all the art. So when I did a show, I'd spend a whole week in the storage rooms with the art. <laughs> you couldn't get better. I mean, what the hell? That was like opening the candy store. So with the Russian stuff, I got really excited. And um, they didn't have much money. I'd done Bankston's show with old pieces of plywood. Have you, you saw that? Yeah, and I, I would love to talk about the Bankston show. Okay, so that's... So after, when it, after you that was the first corrugated thing where I did that. And I did... Uh, they didn't... They tried to thwart me from doing anything, the, the county. And so they said uh, they don't have money for for plywood, and they don't have money for these materials. And they were trying to get me to just do white drywall, right? So I went <laughs> I went down the storage room, found all this painted plywood, and I said, great, I'll use that. So that's what happened. And uh, the corrugated made sense with the thing, and exposing the studs made sense there. I don't know if that was before Laura Stern, I, you, the dates you'd have, I don't know. So tell us what the general... But anyway, the fun of it was the Rico's call. Do you want to hear that one? Okay. So the, the um, Russian show opens, a lot of fanfare, everybody loved it. Ed was there for the opening and he wouldn't talk to me. And I couldn't figure out what the hell he was and the next day I get a call from Rico Mizuno. Frank's on. 
Ed mad at you. <laughs> he said, why? Because I had tried to call him and he wouldn't answer. That's why he was, wouldn't talk to me that way. Ed, very mad at you. I said, why? She says, you remember Lolly Bell's toilet? <laughs> I said, yes. You remember Laura Stern's dining room window? I said, yes. You rip Ed off. <laughs> that was worth it. I mean, just to be able to hear that. God, I love that shit when that went on. Was, was she talking about the Russian constructivist show? Yes, or, yes. Or Bankston show? No. Nobody bothered me in Bankston show, which was way earlier, right? I think Bankston show was way before the Russians. I thought the Russian show came first. Oh, maybe it did. But so for the Russian constructivist show, did you have the open studs in Korg? Yeah. Really? Yeah. The Russian show has all that. Yeah. So tell but us. I was ripping off tract houses, <clears throat> and it was bigger scale, but I did see those things, and I'm sure it had an, an effect on me, and maybe it gave me license. A lot of the stuff, you have to realize, a lot of the stuff that they were doing that you couldn't do in architecture gave me a license somehow. Oh, okay. You know, it's so, I mean, Rosenberg's combines, it's okay. To, make, to use junk, because I couldn't get refined details with the kind of people I was working with. You know, I was trained by the Vienna guy at Gruens, but when I started working, I got really cheesy clients, you know, they didn't have any money. And so there were hammer marks and, you know, you couldn't get that Viennese perfection. And luckily I was part of the art scene, I saw what was going on. and. It was kind of enabling, it was license. I, that's the best way to put it, I think. It's somebody else who I think is way the high up here and better than all those crazy architects is using this stuff, so I'd rather go there. I'd rather copy Michelangelo's slaves than, than I'm not gonna mention the architects in LA, but <laughs> than their dumb buildings, right? Um, so. Well, and that strain, it's continued in your work now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The ability and improvisatory nature of using all different kinds of materials and exposing things. And yes, and it allows me to, to work within budgets and stuff because it's, it's, easy, it's it's not so perfect. When I get a client that wants perfect, I have a few now. <laughs> I have trouble with it. The bank building in Berlin was perfect. I mean, the, that sculpture in the middle, I had it designed with lapped joints, and the client demanded butt joints. There's no two pieces of metal the same. They had to make a mold for each piece and then the mold was used once, and they fit like a... That cost 15 million bucks extra. I love um, it. Feels perfect. Yeah, and it, it, it looks great, I mean, yeah. but, you know, would it have mattered if it was lapped? I don't think so. It would have been 15 million dollars. Somebody else could have done something. I think... Uh, I, I, I do think it was like, here was a whole culture, cultural expression, and it was the same in literature. There were people doing, uh, you know, like Kerouac, and I forget all these guys. People Ginsburg that were, Ginsburg, and Corso, Burroughs. Yeah. I worked for Allen for 10 years. You did? I, I got to know him a little bit. We, we were kind of friends, but not close. Um, so, we, could you just tell us a little generally about what the approach was for the banks and what kind of look did you want and th like a casual room thing or like his studio, like just tell us a little bit about what you were going for and then well, the story it was, about it the was, furniture. 
Oh, you, know, you know that one too. <laughs> God, you know everything. My job. Um, well, Billy used to knock down walls and put walls up and in his apartment, in his uh, studio and place. And so that was the context for his paintings. And the, the um, LA County Museum had a brown rug. It's probably still there. <laughs> yeah. And it was out throughout the place and I thought, oh my God. And I didn't think, and Billy was terrible about show. He didn't want to play with me. He didn't want to talk about it. He was so self-conscious. He said, as far as I'm concerned, you can just get one of those racks, put the paintings on the racks. People want to look at it, something they can take it off. So he was not helpful at all. Uh, and my fantasy was to get furniture from his place to put in the show. Because he made new stuff all the time, so I thought, like, great, let's get some of your stuff. Uh, but he wouldn't talk about it, he wouldn't talk about it. So I wanted it to be more like his studio, more like uh, the motorcycle culture he was from. And I went to, uh, yeah. And he didn't know we were doing that. That was a surprise to him. And he was really pissed off when he saw that. But before that opened, he was even more pissed off because nobody would loan me furniture to put in there. And I was desperate. So I called a furniture uh, rental place. And I said, can I get four living rooms? Just anything that's you got. Just send them over to the county for a week until we figure this out. And <laughs> I get a call. I wasn't there the day it arrived. I got a call from Maurice Tuckman. He said, you won't believe what you've done. <laughs> and I went and looked, and it was a great bloody art piece. I mean, <laughs> I don't know who's done anything like that since, but to take rental furniture and put it in a museum with Bankston paintings, what a statement that turned out to be. It was so tough. Oh, my God. And Billy happened to walk in and see it. And he starts screaming. And he called me. He made anti-Semitic comments. You know, he did everything. And then we got through that. So I got rid of it all the same day. We got it out right away. And uh, Ed Jans loaned me stuff. and. People came through a little bit, and we got started getting stuff that that's in there. Then the statue arrives, and he freaked out because in order to stand it up, they they drilled a hole through his boots, his favorite boots that he uses when he. I didn't know they were doing. <laughs> so he's never taken the statue back. I got it in my garage, and. The, all of it fell over in the last big earthquake years ago, and so it's all in pieces. I think he has the head because I saw the head just recently. Yeah, well, we gave him all the stuff. I want him to take it all back because I, you know, it's his. But he's so pissed off the hole in the boots, he won't. Well, I. So there are little residual pissed off corners that if you push the wrong button, you can reawaken them. <laughs> we'll be sure to push those on Tuesday when we all okay. sit down. All right, so let's, can we can we talk about a few different projects that you did? Sure. Okay. So first we're going to talk about the Hollywood Bowl. Mm. And tell us, when you were asked to come to the Hollywood Bowl, what, what problems were you asked to solve? Well, in the 30s, um, the, the, the <coughs> acoustician was Vern Knudsen, who was the chancellor at UCLA when I was doing the Hollywood Bowl. But I knew him through his daughter work that grew in with me. <coughs> and so we'd had dinner at his house and stuff. 
Um, the Hollywood Bowl had a shell that focused the sound, so it was like a trumpet. And if we were sitting on the stage, Hollywood Bowl now with that, you wouldn't hear me. It's, it, it was so strong, it muddled the sound so much that the members of the orchestra couldn't hear each other. Uh, the violins sitting side by side couldn't hear each other. It was so overpowering, the sound. And uh, so that was the biggest problem. And it had to be a, something that could solve it. It didn't have to be permanent, but... So I was called in September by Ernest Fleischmann to visit his house for dinner. <laughs> And he offered me the job to do the Hollywood Bowl. This was in September, and we talked about it. And I was all excited. I was, you know, the young squirt, didn't have any work. So um, he, I said to him, uh, "Who do I talk to about getting paid?" You know, my usual thing that screws me up. If I only st I'd still do it, I get in trouble now. <laughs> If only I'd keep my mouth shut, I'd have tons of work. <laughs> um, he said, no, 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 you don't understand. This is a big opportunity for you. This is your chance, kid. This is Broadway. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, you don't understand. I can't afford to do that. I don't have resources. Uh, I have family. Same thing I told Mike. Um, so he was pissed off at me, and I, he was, and I just met him, so I didn't really know him. So then, uh, I was very disappointed, but I got over it. Oh, I did say to him, if you want it done for free, you know, Pereira's got a big office, and he's does charity work for museums and stuff, and Beckett's here, and they can afford to do this stuff. So in November he calls me. Now, it had to open in May, right? So September, now November. So I, he says, uh, well, I call prayer, I, I don't, they can't do this. You're going to have to do it. So come in and tell me how much it's going to cost. <laughs> so I went in and I think I gave him a fee of $10,000 to do it. And uh, I came up with the idea of the sauna tubes because sauna tubes are used to pour concrete to make columns, you know. And you can buy them cheap. And if you they reflect sound. They're not great because they're not dense, but they, we tried it and it neutralizes the, the sound, that focusing thing. And then we capped the ends and found that it was, there was a vibration that was, because of the capped ends, that uh, uh, enhanced the bass section. Pretty interesting, it was just a discovery by, by chance. So we built that. I remember going to the board meeting. Every board meeting has a developer or builder on it. I found that out every time I go to one of these things. And there was a builder named Zuckerman who built a lot of Phallus Verde stuff. Really nice guy. So the budget for the tubes was $10,000 and my fee was $10,000. So he couldn't get around the, the scale thing. And he said, isn't it unusual for an architect's fee to be the same as the construction cost? <laughs> I didn't know what I looked at him kind of. I said, I think there's a story about some genius that figured out to push a button and it saved millions of dollars. I said, maybe we'll be lucky. <laughs> uh, what were the tubes made out of? Cardboard. 
they're they're laminated, they're thick, and they have um, resin in them. And they pour concrete and then they unravel them, like a, that. Um, I don't think it had been used for anything like this before. People have used it since, the Shigeru Ban guy, Japanese architect, about 10 years ago used it for something. And didn't they end up using it for 10 years in the Hollywood Yeah, it stayed, it stayed there for a long time. Mrs. Chandler hated it. She was, she couldn't go to the bowl anymore. And then we got rid of the pool in front of the bowl because Zubin, if, if you've ever experienced it, it's a really interesting experience. If you stand at the conductor's podium and the music's coming at you, it comes to here and it disappears. It's like some amazing kind of weirdness. You all of a sudden you feel like you've just gone into space or something. So if you give a talk from this thing, <laughs> nobody hears you. <laughs> it, you're talking to the wind. It's so big. Um, so, and since the pool was there, there was no sense of relationship between the audience and the conductor. So he was losing the sound. He, was, he didn't feel any humanity near him. And so that's when we took the pool out and did all that stuff. All right, let's, can we talk about your house in Santa Monica? <coughs> yeah, I still live there, unfortunately, or fortunately. Fortunately, and it seemed to me like that was such a liberating moment in your life in terms of being able to really do something that you had control of and you were the client and Berta was there. It was like your new life. It seemed like this... When I look back, that this was really kind of a... It was a turning point, yes. It was the first time I was completely on my own. But I had $50,000, that's all. And I think Freddie Wiseman loaned me some money for it. And I paid him back years, some years later. Um, so tell us a little bit well, about was, what the uh, house was like... She, she, uh, she was pregnant. Uh, we were living in an apartment in, in, in uh, Ocean Park, the building I did there. Um, and we knew we had to get a house sooner or later. We had to get out of there. And I think we had the baby already. And then she, uh, I said, well, you, I don't have time. You get a realtor and you figure it out. Because I'm really bad at that kind of stuff. When it comes to doing stuff for myself, I'm not so good. Um, so she found the realtor. Yeah. Uh, looked at, around for a while and she found this house. It was a gambler roof uh, on a corner. I didn't pay attention where it was or anything. I, the zoning, I didn't do anything. She liked it. I said, buy it. And we figured out how to get money. I think that's where Freddie loaned me money to buy it. Um, and I guess I couldn't stand it the way it was. Um, yep, that's it. <laughs> and I... No wonder. Yeah. And I figured out that there was... We were behind the setback line, so we had four or five feet in front. We had all the side yard, and we had some feet in the backyard. So I started wrapping around it. Now, I had done that before. Not many people know this. I don't think we talk about it a lot. But in Hollywood, uh, I forget the name of the street. I almost had it. St. Ives. Um, the office was slow. Uh, and so we went out and bought, figured out how to buy this house. Everybody chipped in. 
and we remodeled it and sold it. And that was how we were going to keep the office alive. And it was a house on St. Ives, and I built a house around it. So that's the first time we did that. And it was really neat. And so, um, uh, I think Jerry Magnet bought it from us back then. Um, so when I saw this one, I, I was sort of in the same mind. To I, What I really wanted to do was play one off against the other, which I couldn't do up there. We didn't have the money. Or the, I, didn't, I don't even know if I had the idea first. It sort of came, it evolved from this. Um, but this house was a two-story and it was on the corner. It was the only two-story. It's in a transition zone. So across the street on, on Washington, it's a R3 and behind us, it's an R3. So we're right in the transition between single family. And, um, and I wanted to preserve the character of the Dutch Gambrel House, so because it, it was iconic in a way, and I wanted to preserve its iconicity, and so I built the house around it and played uh, collage, I guess, against the other house. That's what I was doing. And was there a sense of like the intrusion and the cutting in on it? Was that was that something kind of new, and what was the reaction to that? But to wrap something around an existing space and then cut into <laughs> <laughs> well, it was. I mean, it was interesting because I preserved. Uh, there's still one wall there that's preserved with the old paint on it. Um, um, I preserved all the framing, uh, all the nails, the footprints in the structure, everything. I, you know, if, if I hadn't known combines, I probably wouldn't have done it, right? Uh, and were you satisfied with how it came out? Was there a, a feeling of like, look, I, this was my own thing and you were able to do it and that gave you a, a different level of confidence? Yeah, well, I didn't, I didn't think I would have to show it to anybody. You know, I was doing it for myself. The kids in the office were all egging me on, you know. Uh, Paul Lubowicki was there. Uh, I think uh, my excitement was that I changed it, and I did it for real cheap. I loved, I never got a picture of this, but I loved the idea of the kitchen being on the driveway. And I had the, so if you can imagine the kitchen with the framing up, you know, looking down that, that space, and a steamroller for the asphalt was in the room. How they got it in there, <laughs> and it was going back and forth. Yeah, so the cabinets weren't in, but in that width, they, they had a small steamroller, and they were steamrolling the asphalt. And I mean, if that, why I didn't photograph it? I mean, it was a great art piece in itself. We could have, we, we were contenders, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, uh, let's, can we talk for a quick second about the parking garage at the Santa Monica Mall? Oh, God. We can skip that one if you no, want. No, no, it's all right. It was, um, uh, because I had done, I had done this, I had done this the chain link before, you know. So there's pieces of it, and um, what was I looking at? Who was I looking at? Irwin would start looking at that, so I may have been looking at at his stuff, but I don't think he'd done the scrim pieces yet. Maybe he did. Did he do a scrim peek at Duan Gallery? So before this, yeah. 
Uh, so it's probably that's probably who, who I was looking at. Uh, but I was interested before all that in denial. So I was I was talking to this to shrink. I was talking to Milton Wexler, and I would I went. I remember went to a a conference on denial, a shrink's conference on denial, which I really found fascinating. And I took it into my world as there are materials that people use in abundance, but they hate it. So the f first thing I think was, was, I did it with cardboard. That's how I got into cardboard and that's how I got into chain link. Chain link was produced in such quantities worldwide and used and people hated it, right? And I went to a chain link factory and I watched them for one hour. They made enough chain link in one hour to cover the Santa Monica freeway one, one side from downtown to the beach. It was just knitting. <laughs> um, and that fascinated me that it was, and so I said, well, what if, if they're gonna use it, why not, let's try and make it pretty. So I made some models where I had, where I used it, where it cut through a shape. And uh, it's in that yellow book, there's pictures of it. Yellow book. And uh, I made a little cage for Long Beach that I gave to Pete Walker. I think he still owns it. I gave him the piece, the model. Um, And I got really excited about it as, as a thing. And I got excited about it on two levels. One, that, that it, was, it was a new thing to be playing with. It was ephemeral. It was beautiful, if you did it right. It was cheap. And then I got carried away with that it, that I could call the chain link fence guy and give him coordinates on the ground and a height and describe the building over the phone and he would, could build it without me. I got really excited about that. And that's when I uh, fell in love with fire brick. Uh, Carl, Carl Andres, fire brick. Because I thought Carl had called the brickyard, gave him a coordinate on the wall and said, do soldier course for 15 feet out from the wall. And he didn't have to go see it, he could phone it in. I thought, that's the ultimate, you know, art. It's crazy, that'd be great. Uh, and then years later I met Carl and talked to him about it and he said, no, 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 that's not what I was doing. And I have the little drawing he made saying, Saying 185 fire brick is different than saying fire brick, fire brick, fire brick, fire brick 180 times. So uh, I realized he, for him it was the tactile thing of picking up the brick, putting it there. He enjoyed the, you know, he was probably wanting to be a bricklayer or a contract. I don't know what he wanted to be, but he loved that toying with the materials and, and I could understand that because I used to work in a hardware store and I loved I would just sit there and play with all of it. Um, so I then made it for the Cabrillo Marine Museum and I figured it was really cheap and what happened Cabrillo was it's a city project we only got one chain link bidder and he bid it at the cost of marble, and they had to take it because there was only one bidder, and there was a law that they had to take. They they had to build a building. This was the only guy that bid, and they had to take it. So that was big. It's still down there. It, it could have been a marble building. <laughs> it could have if this was such a great solution, it really worked, and especially for Santa Monica. Well, you know what you're not getting is that faces the auditorium, and the auditorium has one of those grill facades, and so I was talking to that, trying to make a 
this into a space. And at the time, I talked to the city about trying to look at it that way, because it would have been interesting to do something with it, to connect the city hall to the Santa Monica, to the auditorium, to the Rand Corporation. But the people didn't talk to you about things like that. Well, the idea of building, the idea of having kind of a, a center, almost like a, a, an Ita a traditional European square or something, yeah, yeah. with let's say Loyola or Edgemar, yeah. those are two projects that seem to have that kind of concept. Yeah, right. So do you want to talk, maybe should we talk about Loyola and Edgemar? Uh, very, very different times, right? Well, so let's talk about Edgemar. And like Abby Share, what her idea was. Crabby Share, Abby Share. <laughs> you call her Crabby Share. <laughs> <laughs> Abby was, and I, I know she's a funny lady, but I always loved her. Um, she was so kind of innocently pursuing something with honor and and hope and all kinds of things. She wasn't, and she wanted to take on the male world that she came, her brother was a developer of a family, and she wanted to be something, a persona. She was involved in the art world a little bit. Uh, she's a rich lady at the time, so she was, you know, invited to everything where everybody was trying to take her, get her to donate this and that, I think. And uh, I had a lot of shopping center experience. And I told her this thing ain't gonna work. And I said, look, you got a brother as a shopping center guy, bring him down here and we'll, we'll talk you out of this. And he tried and I tried and we couldn't. And she was right in the end. Damn if she wasn't. So she dogged it through in spite of all of us. And she wanted something special. It was a tight budget. She wanted to, uh, I don't know whether the museum was in the mix at the beginning, I forget, maybe. Um, what was her idea? Was that she wanted kind of like a, a Italian mountain village space, of mixed use? Like yeah, space? she was looking at, uh, San Gimignano, San Gimignano, I think. Is that right? Was that written in something? No, but I was just there and it's just like that. Yeah, but she'd been there and she asked me if she liked San Gimignano, yeah. Um, so, yeah, she wanted a village of some kind, but it, it doesn't work for a shopping center, you know, a shopping center and, and creating this, vector to go back into the middle is an absolute no-no. <laughs> and the, the store in the back is going to die, which it didn't. But that restaurant never, the restaurant in the back can never sustain itself. No. No, I think it never, I think it worked kind of. I don't think it was a very, uh, brilliantly successful. I think the theater helped. And so the stores in front do better than the ones in the back, I'm sure. Well, just from a personal standpoint, I hang out here all the time. And when I first discovered Edgemar, it was incredible. It was like a community. And it wasn't just because of peace, but it was like a public space in Santa Monica. And you were kind of off the street. It was like, it, it, and I still love going there. I yeah, think it's I, wildly I, successful in a lot of ways. And especially the central courtyard and how it pulls you in yeah, I don't think the business of it ever really, they didn't get high rents and stuff like that, but she made it work. Uh, and she, she, was, she was great. She took a flyer, she did a good job. Can you just talk very briefly about kind of the entryway of how you kind of come in on the diagonal and um, you know being set off from the street, but I think you also talked a little bit about you can visualize from the interior you have a sense of the outside even though you can't really see it. Well, the, this, this was shopping center um, uh, modeling, you know, that 
the store with the green tile on the front was landmarked and you couldn't tear it down so we had to keep that uh, at least the facade of it had to be kept um, we had to excavate for parking and when it so I designed it so that thing was there and that as you came along the streets you could see as much I mean it you know I want a u-shaped thing would have worked right so we didn't have a room to do that so I centered it like this so you could from here you could see in here and from here you could see in there uh, under construction the front facade broke fell down it wasn't my fault we didn't do it on purpose it was really everybody was careful but it, it didn't work and uh, so I rebuilt it the way it was but with different materials that's why I used the green tile and the copper and all that but it's a copy of what was there but I couldn't do it in the old way because I wanted to signify that it was a copy by making new materials. <coughs> but it feels very different from yeah. the rest of the space, the Pete's copy. Yeah. Um, do you have a little bit more energy to do one or two sure. more? Do you want to take a break? I may go to the bathroom. Okay. Do I have to unhook? Unless you want us to... Does this go...